brother left. <laughs> well, it might be spiritual. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe not. We're going to look at that in a couple of different ways today. Ephesians 6, 10 to 12 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. I've been wondering something. Where did all the demons go? Seriously, where did all the demons go? I mean, when Jesus was here, he was casting out demons left and right. In fact, if you, remember, in fact, if you look at the New Testament, you know the word evil occurs 406 times? 406 times. Satan occurs 53 times. The devil, the word for devil, occurs 32 times. Demon or demons occurs 79 times. And the adversary occurs 22 times in, in, in Scripture. In fact, in Matthew 10, 8, it says, Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons, freely you have received, freely give. One of the things that we're supposed to do if we're a Christian is be able to cast out demons, he's saying there, right? Well, where did all the demons go? They must have left. Matthew 12, 24, But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, <clears throat> It is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. It's so noticeable that he's driving out demons that even the religious leaders say, Well, he's doing it by the power of the demon, by the power of Beelzebul. <laughs> right. Mark 1, 39, So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues, and what? Driving out demons. Mark 3, 13 to 15, Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He's actually calling followers, people to follow him. And from those followers, he's going to select 12 really special, significant men. He says he appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. These guys are like not even Christians yet. I mean, you think about it. The people, that, even the disciples who are following Jesus, they're not really Christians yet because Jesus hasn't died yet. So they can't totally be Christians yet, can they? In fact, they don't have the Holy Spirit, although Jesus is going to kind of do some special things to give them a special anointing. In fact, that's what Mark 3 here says, that they're going to be anointed with power to be able to cast out demons. I'm just getting, wondering, where did all the demons go? Mark 16, 17, and these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, people who believe in me, Jesus says, in my name, they will drive out demons, they will speak in new tongues. I guess it all happened at Pentecost and everything was taken care of, right? Everything finished. It must have finished because where are all the demons? Mark, Mark 6, 13, they drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. Wow, that must have been an incredible time. They must have taken care of all of them because where are all the demons? Luke 4, 41, moreover, demons come, came out of many people shouting, you're the son of God. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew he was the Messiah. And then finally, Luke 9, 1, when Jesus had called the 12 together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. There it is. He, they got rid of them all. That's what it says, right? Gave them authority to drive out all demons. So obviously all the demons were taken care of and we don't have to deal with spiritual issues anymore, right? One would think that if you really closely looked at the theology and the mentality of people today in this country. In this country, we don't have to deal with demons because we're much more intellectually sound. We're much wiser than that. We understand that, this, that, that sickness and um, even mental illness and those things have nothing to do with spiritual things, even addictions and all that. They have nothing to do with spiritual things. It's just, you know, the way we were born. Well, is that true? The existence of spirit beings, both benevolent and malicious, has been accepted in the vast majority of human cultures and religions across time and place. This was clearly the case for the ancient Near Eastern world of the Old Testament. It's from a book called Understanding Spiritual Warfare. Prior to the modern era, the Christian tradition, by and large, interpreted the New Testament as representing angels and demons as personal spiritual agents. From the early church through the Middle Ages to the Reformation era, leading scholars and writers of the various streams of the Christian tradition continue to affirm, speculate on, and significantly develop the general New Testament con conceptions of Satan and the demonic. 
Maybe Flip Wilson took care of. <laughs> if you're old enough, some of you remember that Flip was the one who said, the devil made me do it. <laughs> Here's the sad thing. Much of modern liberal Christianity has tended to see angels and demons as outdated ideas that are best left behind, except perhaps as poetic metaphors for expressing the idea of evil. That's, a whole, that's what the liberal theologians are actually saying that today. It's just a philosophy, just, a, just an idea out there. You know, it's just symbolic. Or, you, it, well, it's the other man who said, oh no, Satan was God's messenger doing God's work and so we should celebrate him. Oh my. Naturalistic explanations of human belief in and or experience of spirit beings appeal to a range of purely natural phenomena, including sociological, psychological, and here's one, even nutritional facts. Okay, so it's not a demon, it's just your, your nutrition that's off, and <laughs> that's what's messing you up. Commonly, Western academics dismiss contemporary belief in angels and demons as an unfortunate idiosyncrasy associated with such questionable belief systems as the New Age movement or religious fundamentalism. Now, have you noticed you've been grouped in? If, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you're part of religious fundamentalism, which puts you uh, equal to New Age. Well, that's interesting. Whew. In a study um, a book, an excellent book that I read called Understanding Spiritual Warfare, Four Different Views of Spiritual Warfare. Um, one of the theologians in there is a very liberal theologian. His name's Wink. And, um, it's Wink's demythologizing hermeneutic is, and that means just how he interprets the Bible. And demythologizing, that means taking all spiritual real, spirituality out of things is rooted in nothing more than the fact that it is generally unfashionable in Western academic culture to believe in personal, transcendent, invisible beings. Did you hear what I just said? That our culture, and particularly our educational or Western academic culture, doesn't believe in personal, transcendent, invisible beings like demons and the Holy Spirit. Uh-oh. Because you see, that's the problem. If you don't believe that there's demons, you also don't believe that there's a Holy Spirit. Commonly, Western academics dismiss contemporary belief in angels and demons as unfortunate. Oh, I jumped down. He goes on. He says, this Western perspective is itself not based on any sound assessment. Get this one. This is, this is the educational, the academics. Their, their perspective is not based on any sound assessment of empirical evidence or any sound philosophical argument. To the contrary, as Paul Eddy and I have argued elsewhere, if one sets aside the Western academic prejudice against such notions, see, that's the problem. We just don't believe that they're out there, so therefore they don't exist. In fact, that's what's really kind of humorous is that, that these, these um, psychologists and sociologists will even go on to say, well, they don't exist in, except in countries where they believe that they exist. Now, that's novel. <laughs> so if your country is a country like in Uganda or Kenya or someplace like that, and you believe that there's demons there and you believe that there's satanic things and you, you believe in the power of black magic, that's where they exist. But in a country like America, since we don't believe that they exist, they don't exist. No wonder there's no demons here in our country. He goes on. <clears throat> Western academic assumption that spirit agents do not exist apart from humans can justifiably be judged to be a prejudiced, myopic, small-minded, chronocentric, an ethnocentric perspective. I specify that it is unfashionable in Western academic culture to believe in invisible agents because despite the repeated claims from certain academics, numerous studies show that the vast majority of Westerners outside of academic circles continue to believe in Satan, angels, and demons. Clinton Arnold says Jesus was fully aware that there was a supernatural enemy who would organize his malevolent forces to powerfully oppose the carrying out of Christ's mission. With this in mind, Jesus assured his followers of his presence with them and that he possessed all authority, all authority over the spiritual realm. Mark Bubeck said, this, the subject of spiritual warfare is one that Satan has sought to cloud with much emotional charge and subjective prejudice. 
Let me read the text for you again. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world. By the way, just a a quick highlight there. When he's talking about that, he's not talking about Trump or Clinton, okay? He's talking about the spiritual realm of darkness against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. What does he say? Be strong in the Lord. That's where he begins. Be strong in the Lord. The fact is we're weak. Anyone, anyone who's dealing with sin knows you're weak, right? I think that's everybody here. Well, maybe there's some perfect people that, yeah, there's some of you that are perfect, but, but most of us give in to sin even when we say we don't want to, right? We fight it. We're going we're gonna to beat it. We're, we, we make a commitment. We put it in blood even, sign the document and all, and then what happens the next day? You know, there, oh, I just did it again. We're weak. And the, and the thing is, we need to trust God. We need to believe God. We need to exercise and train with the armor of God is what Paul is telling us here. Psalm 24, 8 says, Who is this king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. We need a warrior working on our behalf that is much stronger than us because the battle is bigger than us. Psalm 31, 24, Be strong and take heart, all you who hope in the Lord. The strength comes from him, not from us. Psalm 140, verse 7, Sovereign Lord, my strong deliverer, you shield my head in the day of battle. Have you ever wondered why the helmet of salvation is listed as one of the most important pieces of the armor of God? Why is it called salvation? Because guess where most of your sin starts? In your head. Okay? You start thinking it. You start, oh, that would be good. Oh, I... I, could just be you start a negative thought about somebody else. Here's one, just a negative thought about yourself. I'm no good. I'll never be any good. I'm just a rotten, terrible, no good. And you, whatever other words you use for that. One of our challenges is that we don't see the spiritual realm. So we look around, we just, you know, everything's normal, you know. Now, we might see some people and they look a little weird. (laughs) But some of us aren't looking in the mirror. (laughs) 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 15 says, When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh, no, my Lord. What shall we do, the servant asked. This is the servant of Elisha. And and Elisha has been prophesying, and and the king's been, the the, the Jews have been protecting, and and, and every time these, these soldiers try to do something, Elisha tells them what they're going to do ahead of time. Like, in fact, the, 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 they actually, the general actually says, you know, what is this? Okay, who's the traitor in the camp? And, th- and, the, and his soldiers all come in. No, it's none of us. It's none of us. Don't kill any of us, please. It's Elisha. It's the man of God. He keeps telling everything that you're doing before you even do it. And the servant now of Elisha sees the army that's come, huge army, to kill one guy. <laughs> To kill one guy, (laughs) Elisha. And here's what Elisha says. Don't be afraid. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, Open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. There's a spiritual battle going on, folks, that most of us... We experience its effect. We're bothered by it, but we don't see it because we don't see the spiritual realm. I still remember the day that I prayed for our our leadership team of the church because there were some serious spiritual issues in this church, and, and and the leadership team wasn't taking it serious enough, in my opinion. They didn't recognize it. They'd downplay it. And so I prayed a prayer, and I warned them about this prayer. I said, I'm going to pray that, you, that one or all of you get this gift of spiritual discernment, which the, is ability to distinguish spirits. In other words, to recognize spiritual forces. 
And if you ever have that experience, it's not a fun experience. If you actually see demonic beings, it's not an enjoyable time. We prayed that prayer, and then some months later, something happened. One of the members of the board came to me after this event where somebody just was really irate. And, and this man, the board member said, I need to talk to you, Bill. And he said, the other night when that, uh, that thing happened, I saw a demon. Really? You saw a demon? Yeah, I saw a demon. I said, well, tell me what you saw. I saw a demon. No, 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 describe for me what you saw. And this man, gentleman went on to talk about the things that he actually saw that night. Um, a demonic being per coming out of this man's chest and pointing his finger at the rest of us. And, and he said, I saw, I said, okay, I think you saw a demon. And then I said, do you remember? I didn't even get the w full sentence out. Because I was about to say, do you remember the prayer I prayed? And he's like, yes, and I'm not happy about it. <laughs> <laughs> we need to be strong in the Lord. And some of us need that spiritual gift to be able to discern when we're dealing with spiritual things. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. There are battles that you're fighting that are supernatural in nature, and you need God's strength to win those battles and to fight them. The scripture says that, that we're supposed to put on the full armor of God. We're going to talk about that in coming weeks, but let me just summarize with this, this passage, 2 Corinthians 10, 3-5. The weapons that we have are different than the weapons of the world. Here's what it says in 2 Corinthians 10, 3-5. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. Now, our problem is that some of us do. We, we get angry at somebody, and what do we do? We holler. <laughs> Instead, there's a spiritual battle that may be taking a place. I want to warn you even about the times that you get angry with somebody that you care about. That may be more spiritual in nature than you understand and comprehend. The evil is trying to damage you and your relationships. And so the very ones that you love may, they be, the, be, may be the very ones that you speak ill against. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Our weapons, Paul says, have the ability to break down strongholds. We actually, in fact, what did he say to Peter? He said, look, Peter, I'm going to build my church on you, on this pebble, on this rock, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We are in a battle to break down the gates of hell and to set people free. Matthew 16, 18, I tell you, Peter, you are that rock, and I'm going to build my church on it. What's a stronghold? Paul calls spiritual issues strongholds. He says that we have an unusual weapons to overcome them. In military terms, a stronghold was a, a tower or a similar structure like that, a, a place of protection, a fortress. It was, uh, it, it was also a structure that could be used. To, you'd put it up against a wall, and you would use it to climb over that wall to break into a city, to, de to destroy the city. That's a stronghold. A stronghold for the sake of our study includes corporate sins that are repeated, lies that the church maintains, unresolved conflict, bitterness, unforgiveness. And the, notice the last two are said to give Satan a foothold in your life. I'm going to share from John MacArthur for a few moments. John MacArthur says, Human weapons have no effect on evil. Human weapons cannot fight the kingdom of darkness. Human weapons cannot deal with principalities and powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in the heavenlies. Human weapons can't fight on that level. Human weapons cannot liberate souls from the kingdom of darkness. Human weapons cannot transform sinners. Human weapons cannot sanctify saints. That means clean us up. They have no effect in the spiritual realm, no effect on the kingdom of darkness, no effect on Satan, no effect on his supernatural systems, no effect on the eternal souls of people. And MacArthur goes on, what are we talking about here? What are the weapons of the world? What are the weapons of the flesh? Human reason, human wisdom, arguments of rationalism, human plans, strategies, ingenuity, organization, skill, eloquence, personality, cleverness, entertainment, religious showmanship, philosophical, psychological speculations, the mystique of the mystics, artificial atmospheres creating artificial environments. All the human approaches are impotent weapons. They are simply weapons of the flesh. So the Apostle Paul is saying, look, 
You've got some very formidable enemies to deal with. And the weapons that it's going to take to smash, and by the way, that's a word for demolish. You will be able to demolish strongholds. The, the word destruction means to demolish, to bring about the demolition, to the complete disintegration of fortresses must be by formidable, divinely powerful weapons. Oh, by the way, the word for these strongholds could also be the same word as prison. A fortress can be a prison. People who are ensconced and entrenched in these prisons in these fortresses are imprisoned by them. The very place they think is their refuge is the place where they are prisoners. And their fortress becomes ultimately their tomb. They're the prisons of the damned fortified by earth and hell. What does Paul say we should do? Take your stand against the devil's schemes. Take your stand against the devil's schemes. We have to stand firm against the lies of e evil. Michael Green said, It would be broadly true to say that disbelief in the devil is a characteristic only of materialistic Western Christendom. John 8, 44. They came to Jesus. The religious people did. And they said, You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning. They got that right. Meaning Satan. Not holding to the truth. Yeah, that's Satan. For there's no truth in him. And when he lies, he speaks his native language. For he is a liar and the father of lies. That's Satan. And too many of us are hearing his lies and believing them. Too many of us are submitting to his lies and allowing them to control us. Too many of us are being defeated and discouraged by the lies of the evil one. Paul Heber said there are two dangers in spiritual warfare. The first one is the denial of of the reality of Satan. That's a bad place to be. Well, there's no Satan, so we don't need to worry about him. <laughs> he just won. But the second is undue fascination and fear of Satan. We give him too much authority. We place him in a position equal with God, and he is not. So to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. Not true. How can you say that we shall be set free? And Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, everyone who sins, have you felt this? Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now, a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. We are weak and we need God's strength. We need to fight the battle with him. We need to use the resources that God has given to us. We are in a spiritual battle, friends. Admit it or not, believe it or not, we're in a spiritual battle. Scott Moreau says the Bible does not try to prove God's existence. Did you know that? The Bible, it doesn't need to prove God's existence because the Bible believes God exists. It simply notes that only the fool says there is no God. That's Psalm 14.1, by the way. In the same way, nowhere in the Bible is Satan's existence proven. It assumes that people recognize Satan as real and that his reality is important. Satan's not portrayed as a mere metaphor or symbol of evil in Scripture. He is a created being who entices us towards evil. His very name means accuser, and it aptly describes him. Spiritual warfare is not believing that Satan is everywhere, but it's recognizing that wherever he is, God holds the leash. For greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Folks, some of us are putting Satan at a place where we, we move into that place of fear of Satan and we put him equal with God. Let me use some theological terms for a few moments. God is omniscient. That means he knows all things. Satan is not omniscient. He doesn't know everything. But he'll know things that you want to tell his minions. God is omnipresent. That means God is everywhere. He's here with us. He's with the kids down there. He'll be with the kids at school this week. God's everywhere. Satan is not omnipresent. 
Satan is a created being. He localizes in one place. And some of us are giving him way too much credit because he does not equal God. He is not the partner with God. He is an underling created by God who then fell, who chose pride over worship like some of God's people. Spiritual warfare is an invisible battle in the spiritual realm involving a power confrontation between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness. Mike Matthew Lynn said, those who see a need only for deliverance err just as greatly as those who see a need only for medicine, only for psychiatric treatment, or only for environmental change when several or all of these factors may contribute to a person's suffering. In the, in the American Greek world, the Western way of thinking, we kind of want to compartmentalize everything. So, so if you're sick, you go see a doctor, take an aspirin, rest in bed, right? Well, that was, I guess, decades ago. <laughs> now we just give you a pain pill. No, sorry about that. <laughs> <clears throat> Kinnaman says, what we have before us is a titanic clash between the biblical worldview which integrates the natural power of God's world and the supernatural powers at work in it over against the modern secular worldview which in its godlessness has excised, gotten rid of spirituality altogether. Don't blame evil for your sin. Flip was way wrong. Flip never met the devil. Flip probably wasn't that important to the devil. And none of us are as well. Or we may have one of his minions that tries to talk to us and tempt us and all. But the fact is, is that most of us are never dealing with Satan himself at all. And when you sin, instead of crediting Satan for that, well, the devil made me do it. Well, I was tempted again by evil. Another spirit of, of lust came upon me and just you know, really messed me up. Spirit of addiction, you know, that, that alcohol, that spirit of alcohol, that's what it was, you know. You know spirit of the bottle, it just really attacked me. The, the spirit of meanness, you know, the spirit of anger. You, you, whatever name you want to give to your sin, you, and we sometimes we, we call it the spirit, and we say, it's the spirit that did, that, that evil demon that did it to me. And you know what? All we're doing is copping out on dealing with our sin when confessing our choice. Fact is, evil doesn't have to do a lot with us at times because we've already given in to sin. So don't blame evil for your sin. But note this, Jesus is greater than the evil. It's a fact, he won on the cross. And by the cross, it's, Scripture says he was victorious. 1 Corinthians 15, 57, but thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ. He is the power available to us when we're battling sin. And here's one of my favorite passages. It's from 1 John 4. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And by the way, every time you hear me preach, you better be testing me too. Okay? I don't stand up here saying, I am God. I stand up here trying to be a servant of God. But I can sin just like the rest of you, just as much. So you need to test what I say and see whether it's true. Test it with the word of God. Test it by the Holy Spirit. See what, if it's truth or not. And here's one of the ways you can test it. This is how you recognize the spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. By the way, Every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. And what a great test when you're dealing with spiritual forces. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. And verse 4 goes on to talk about the greatness power of God that's, that is with us in Christ. And by the way, when I was writing my doctoral thesis, some of you know the story 
I was right in the middle of this section, and I was dealing with some spiritual things, and I was sitting there in the, in the, in the living room and, and doing some writing, and started feeling some things, and I was just getting a little concerned. And, and then I looked down at my, my computer, and I had been editing and from two different documents on, on my computer. And all of a sudden, I looked over on this screen where I'd been editing from, and a whole section was gone. It had disappeared. What really troubled me was in its place was 666. I mean, at first, I was perturbed. You know what 666 stands for, right? It's the, the number of mankind. It's the number of the beast. It's the number of the Antichrist. <laughs> and I'm, like, I'm looking at it like, how did I push six three times and lose whatever was there? And then all, and when all of a sudden, I'm like, what did I just lose? Well, I was smart enough, somehow remembered, hey, if you hit the, you know, the back, you know, go, go re reverse what you just did, I did that, and fortunately I hadn't saved my document, and so it went backwards, and then I looked to see what had been covered over by 666. And you know what was covered over? 1 John 4, 1 through 4. That statement, that he is greater than evil, had been covered over with 666. And then I got the chill down my back. <laughs> And then I started to pray a little bit more as I was like, okay, we're under a little bit of an attack right here, but I need to constantly remember that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I do not need to be afraid. The devil is real. His demons are real. But evil, evil has been and will be defeated. Can I remind you what's going to happen at the end of the story? 1 Corinthians 15 says, For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. Everybody dies, right? But through Christ, we're all made alive. But each in, each in turn, Christ, the first fruits. Then when he comes, those who belong to him, then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed, watch this, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. That's the principalities and powers, the rulers of darkness of heavenly places. That's the stuff that Paul's saying we're going to have power over. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet and the last enemy to be defeated. To be destroyed is death. And Revelation 20. And the devil, who deceived them, was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them and each person was judged according to what he had done. Then... Death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. And the lake of fire is the second death. And anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. At the end, evil's defeated. And that includes death. Death is not a friend. Death is not God's intention. Death is an enemy that comes upon us because of sin. And one day it's defeated when Christ comes back. Folks, we, a couple of last things, really the probably the last comment I need to focus on is this. We have the ability to stand firm. We have the ability to defeat evil. We have the power and the resources, spiritual weapons. What's what we're going to be talking about the next coming weeks. That we have all the tools and resources we need to stand firm, to fight on, to not give in to evil. And may I tell you this? That one of the reasons why worship has been painful sometimes in over the years past here. Some of the biggest fights. We've had fist fights in the parking lot over worship here at this church. Just last week, Paul and I went at it. No. <laughs> no, but seriously, there is a past that wasn't pretty. And it was, in, and it was about worship. Do you know why that happened? Because worship 
The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world, but they have power to break down strongholds. Worship is one of the most powerful weapons we have in the arsenal against evil. Worship. Worship. It's, it's so powerful. It dethrones the devil. Psalm, Psalm 8, 2 says, From the lips of children and infants. I love that. Why is it that I love having the children up here? I like to see the children praising why we did VBS and stuff like that. Let them dance and stand up and celebrate God. Because the, ch- the praise of children and infants has been ordained by God. And that praise because of your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. The praise of children, the worship of children has authority over darkness. If God's bigger people could get a hold of that, what could we do? Amen. Scott Moreau said, rather than praying against spirits, it is better to pray for God's spirit to break the rebellious will in human hearts and bring people to repentance before him. Rather than us going around and trying to find the demon under every, under every rock and in every bush. And by the way, they're not all going. But rather than us looking and searching and, you know, and, and trying to, and, and making this big to-do about them, we should be praying about our own hearts and being repentant. Spiritual warfare is not a one-time ritual, folks. It's not simply a set of techniques that we call on or command. It's not a magic exercise that instantly matures us. Spiritual warfare is a lifetime battle to grow and become more like Jesus Christ and to watch him work through us to set others free so that they too might grow. As a follower of Christ, you all have that. You have all that is necessary, all that is necessary to succeed in spiritual conflict. The truth you process teaches you how to live and how to understand your struggles. It does not promise pat or easy answers, but gives hope in the victory that God will give. We can stand firm. And if any of you have ever dealt with a demonic being, you know that sometimes that people get into this big long to do. They're going to lay hands on the person, and you know, in the name of Jesus Christ, come out and run there. And there's this, like this big battle going on and fighting, beating up. This, and 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 what happens? The demon is getting way too much attention. And if you want to follow Jesus' example, you will tell the demon to be silent. And then claim the blood of the Lamb of God to wash that person through. And you will invite that person to actually rebuke Satan. And then you can command that demon to leave. Because here's one of our dangers. People invite evil into their home. We have authority. But if we don't believe they exist, we're probably not going to fight them. If we're afraid of them, we're not going to fight them. If we give them too much credit, we're not going to fight them. But we have the authority and the ability to be strong and to stand firm. Will we? Father, oh God. Too many of us believe lies, some of which we tell ourselves. Evil doesn't even have to do it because we beat ourselves up. We blow it and we say, and then we start to repeat, oh, we'll we'll never get any better. We're always going to be like this. We're just a terrible person. We're just no good. And so why even try? And all of that was a lie. It's a lie from us and it's a lie from evil. It's a lie from the dark. God, you've given us power and authority to stand against evil and to be strong and to be victorious. And I know, Lord, there's times that we're going to doubt that. There's times that we're going to be afraid. There's times that we're going to think it can't happen. But God, I pray that you would give courage and boldness. I'm praying for an anointing of the Holy Spirit to give courage and boldness to the people that are here today. I pray, God, you sent your son Jesus to die for us, and it's through your son that we can have victory over sin because you died on that cross to to pay for our sin and to purchase freedom and forgiveness for us. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would anoint people today with that forgiveness. And that if there's somebody questioning that today, maybe doubts whether you're really existent or not, I pray, God, that you would lead them to you today.
Help us to stand firm and not give in. In Jesus' name, amen.